All right, so for question number one, or topic number one question, uh, we have considered two objects that are submerged in water with a volume of one meter cubed, uh, where one is cube shaped and one is extremely flat. Which one will have the greater buoyancy force? Uh, so this is kind of a trick question based on math and the pressure of it, how pressure acts on an object. So pressure acts on an object based on area. So it could be thought that a larger surface area object could have a greater force. And the mass matters if, this, if the object is on the surface because it will sink to different levels. However, both are submerged. And so the buoyancy force will only be uh, related to the density of the fluid and the volume displaced. And since they're in the same fluid, it will only depend on the volume displaced, which is one meter cubed for both, which means they have the same buoyancy force. Now for number two, we're given a manometer that is open to the atmosphere on sea level and is closed on one end under a vacuum. Uh, what is the height that the air will reach in the manometer with and without changes in gravity? And so we know atmospheric pressure and we're told to find the height reaches. Uh, density of air can be assumed to be constant because the inlet is at sea level and that does not change. Uh, and for part B, height, gravity will change. Uh, so we know gravity at sea level and the density of air. And so for part A, it's a relatively simple calculation uh, to just uh, pressure equals rho GZ. And so we get a Z of 8,607 meters. And then for part B, we have G of Z, or G is a function of Z, and we integrate with respect to Z. And that gets us a value of 8,620 meters, which makes sense due to the fact that gravity will be decreasing, so it has the air has to go to a higher height to cancel out the pressure. Uh, for topic number two, first question is actually the calculation question. Uh, so if a person were to hold a one meter diameter turbine perpendicular and two meters away from the body and spun at a rate of 30 RPM, what is the work that would be generated by the turbine if the mechanical efficiency is 0.5? So we know Mechanical efficiency, the diameter of the turbine, the radius of rotation, and the speed at which it's rotating. And we're told to find work generation. Uh, we can assume the velocity across the entirety of the turbine is constant and can be approximated as the velocity at the center of the turbine. Uh, this is because the velocity of the air entering the turbine on the outside is actually faster than the velocity entering on the inside due to having a higher radius of rotation but we can, we can assume that it's equal to this, the velocity at the center and approximate it that way. Uh, Z1 equals Z2 due to it being per perpendicular and P1 equals P2 equals PATM because all, this is all happening basically outside at atmospheric pressure. Uh, then we can find V2 relative is actually about equal to zero. So we're assuming that the turbine basically takes all energy from the air that enters, or all velocity at least. Uh, and then the center of the turbine is two meters away from the axis of rotation, which is kind of given in the problem. Uh, density of air, and then we have our E mechanical equation, which is essentially a re, uh, reorganization of Bernoulli's, which can simplify down to negative V1 squared over two because P2 equals P1, Z2 equals Z1, and V2 is said, V2 relative is said to be zero. Then we have to find uh, V1 uh, relative, which will essentially be the velocity of the system, uh, but in the negative direction. And so we can find the velocity of the system, which is equal to V1, to be omega r, which gets to 6.28 meters per second. Then we get, uh, once we find the delta E mechanical of the fluid, then we can find the work based on the mechanical efficiency. Uh, and we get that to be negative 58.4 watts. Now for the conceptual question, it's kind of based on the first question, which is why I put it second. Uh, but it's essentially, if the system is moving, how does the momentum balance take into account the moving system? And, ha and how does it modify the velocity term? Uh, and so this is essentially, by this equation where the relative velocity is equal to the absolute velocity 
of the fluid minus the velocity of the system or yeah and so for topic number three the first question is how does Bernoulli take equation take into account the viscous and turbulent effect on the kinetic energy term and so we essentially transform it to be the since the velocity is in an envelope or is changing due to the no slip condition and turbulence uh, the velocity in the center is faster than the velocity near the edge of the pipe but in order to take into account for this we do utilize the velocity average and in order to take into account the viscous and turbulent forces we multiply it by a kinetic correction factor of alpha now for question number six uh, the air is flowing through 12 centimeter diameter pipe at 0 0.05 meters cubed per second and comes to a section of the pipe where the diameter decreases, causing the velocity to triple and the static pressure to decrease by 0.2 kPa. Assuming state one has a kinetic correction factor of one and the process is zero head loss, what is the kinetic correction factor for, of the second, uh, second state or second flow? And so we're given a lot in this problem. We're given the kinetic correction factor one, the volumetric flow one, the diameter of the pipe in state one, and then the difference in the pressure between state two and state one. And we are told to find the kinetic correction factor for number two. Uh, we can assume Z1 equals Z2 because we're not given anything about that in the problem. Uh, and properties, density of air, and G. Uh, so then we can get to use rearranged Bernoulli's equation to be state 2 minus state 1. Um, and then we can cancel out z2 minus z1. And then from that, we equal it to 0 because we're told there is zero head loss and there's no pump or turbine in the uh, system. And so from that, we can get V1 uh, from the volumetric flow rate uh, times the area to get 4.42 meters per second and then v2 because we were given v2 equals three times v3 right here and that gets to 13.3 meters per second we are given uh the p2 minus p1 and so we plug everything in to get a2 and we get a uh, kinetic correction factor equals two and then for a kinetic correction factor of two the flow will be laminar now for topic number four, why does the pressure calculation for an L pipe not use the absolute pressure and force balances? And so this is essentially because the atmospheric pressure acts on the entirety of the pipe. And because the pressure coming into the system on the open end is the atmospheric pressure plus the gauge pressure, the atmospheric pressure cancels out and it's just left with the gauge pressure times area as the force acting on the system. Now for number eight, uh, you're flying with a water jetpack with an input tube length of 20 meters and a diameter of 20 centimeters, an intake volumetric flow rate of 0 0.05 meters cubed per second, and two nozzles with an exit diameter of three centimeters and a total mass of 100 kilograms. What is the maximum height that can be reached? And so this is another problem we're giving a, given a lot, where we're given the V dot into the system, the diameter into the system, and then the diameter out of the system, uh, as well as the mass of the entire system, and the height, the maximum height to which it can accelerate due to the 20 meter input tube length. Uh, we're told to find the maximum height, and we can assume force viscous and force X, Y, e, or force X, y equals zero whereas we're going to be finding a force in the z direction uh pressure absolute equals patm and beta equals one uh, for our properties we have density of water and g as usual now we can start with the basic force balance where force in minus force out equals force of gravity or this or plus force of gravity equals the sum of the forces and so we have to first find m dot in and V in to find the force in, um, which is 79.6 newtons. Then we have to find V out and M out to find the force out, but we multiply, we divide it by two because the vol volumetric flow is split in two, and the M out is split in two. 
Now then we multiply it back by two because there's two different nozzles. And we get a force out of negative 1,170 newtons, all in the z direction. Uh, force gravity is obviously just mg. And then we do the sum of the forces to get 868.86 newtons. And then we can find acceleration from that to be 8.686 meters per second squared. From there, it's essentially a physics one problem where we utilize acceleration height to find the time of acceleration. Uh, and then we can use that to find the distance traveled um, and then to find the velocity at that height or in th the velocity at that time, sorry, uh, which is 18.64 meters per second. Then we're able to find the velocity, the height, the time at which it will reach its max height after uh, it stops accelerating. And then use that to find the maximum height that we can get, which is equal to 40 meters, which does make sense because we are accelerating at essentially a value that is very similar to g. And since we are accelerating up 20 meters and then decelerating at a rate of g, um, it should essentially double the height at which we accelerate, which is approximately what we get. But due to the fact that this is lower than g, it's slightly under 40.